topic we were on was women in Rhodesia. Uh, so, of course, the last thing we talked about was balancing equations, uh, calculating moles to moles, calculating grams to moles, and calculating grams to grams. Okay, so hopefully you guys have practiced some of these types of problems using the chemical equation. Remember, you got to balance your chemical equation first. Um, and then, uh, you know, do the mole to mole ratio thing. Okay, recall we were talking about limiting uh, reagents. Um, it's the thing that gets used up fast, fastest. So um, you can see here, it's going to be a one to one mixture of hydrogen to fluorine. That's what the reaction says, a one mole to one mole to make HF of one mole. So let's just write that down just to make sure what you know what we're talking about. Okay, so if you recall what the chemical equation says, it uh, indicates that we need one mole of hydrogen or one molecule of hydrogen, whatever way you want to look at it, for every mole of uh, molecule of fluorine to make one mole of hydrofluor hydrofluoric acid. But you see here we've got one, two, three, four, five, six moles of hydrogen and only four moles of fluorine. So we've got excess hydrogen, if you will. There's extra hydrogen molecules. Okay. So when we combine these four with these six, of course, the four can only combine with four of these hydrogen molecules. So there's your mixture combining, right? And then when we go over here, we can see we've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight HF molecules, but we still have some unreacted H2 molecules, okay? And that would be your excess reagent, okay? So this would be the excess. reagent or reactant. Reagent and reactant are essentially the same thing. And uh, this would be, of course, your limiting reagent. Because uh, when we came over here, we still had plus excess hydrogen. Notice this isn't one of the products just didn't get reacted, okay? So here's um, a pretty interesting and uh, convoluted problem. Uh, calculate the maximum amount of SO2 that could be produced by reacting 55.2 grams of oxygen with 50.8 grams of uh, hydrogen sulfide. So, let's go ahead and try this problem. So the first thing you're going to have to do in this problem, so this one's a little more difficult than I think I would give you on the test. I'd probably at least give you all of the components of the reaction equation. Uh, but anyway, so let's write this down. H2S dash plus O2.
two to one ratio of these guys, okay? We would have to factor that in here, okay? So if we needed two H2S for every O2 here, we would have to multiply this by two to indicate which one's the limiting reagent, and in that case, the other one would be, okay? So watch that when you are uh, got uh, different numbers of, um, or different coefficients in your reaction equations besides just one, okay? So maybe we'll build a one like that on Monday or something. Okay, so I think the last thing we're going to talk about in um, <coughs> this chapter uh, about calculations involving the chemical equation is reaction yields. Okay, um, a theoretical yield for any reaction, okay, so um, I kind of want to keep this stuff up here, but the theoretical yield for any reaction is going to be the number of moles that the limiting reagent gives you, okay, so that would be like 100% of your reaction when you brought it, okay, so in this case, the reason I want to keep this up here is because it really does help um, to indicate what we're talking about here. So in this case, um, the theoretical amount that could be made is 1.4090 moles. Okay, so that would be theoretical. The actual yield is spelled wrong there too. The actual yield um, is going to be what you uh, get in the lab. Okay, so like if I did this reaction, right, and I didn't get 1.4090 moles of SO2, but, okay, so this is just a number I'm coming up with out of my head, you know? Let's pretend instead I got, uh, I don't know, 1.001 moles SO2. Okay, so this is what I got, um, what I got. problem, right, I would have to give you this number. Okay. So let's go back and figure it out. Remember, the theoretical is this, and that's the actual. I can almost guarantee there'll be a couple of problems like
this was our yield. Or we lost some of it somehow. We dropped it or whatever. Whatever is the case, that's what you would get. Okay, um, here's another calculation for you guys to try. Um, you can do it not only with mass or with the moles, but if you have the masses, you can compare them directly. Okay? But of course, they have to be the mass of the same component of the reaction. Because if they're different components, if you got the mass of Al and Fe, right, those are weighed differently. And their relative weight by the periodic table is different. So you're going to have to convert them to moles. But if you got mass and mass of the same uh, react or the same product, then you can do this as well. And um, so you could go over that one on your own and then try this one on your own. And it looks like here's another one. I think that's going to try on your own. So um, there's terms that we use if we uh, went to 100% and we got all of the reactants to go to product, which of course, that never happens in an actual reaction. We uh, normally get some loss of uh, products from uh, reactants, so not all of the limiting reagent, if you will, went to products, okay? Um, but if this is the case, so this theoretical type reaction condition, we call this a quantitative reaction, if all reactants go to products. I have a question. Uh -huh. Well, it would be better if you turned them all into moles, okay? Because that doesn't uh, account, that discounts the relative weight factor, okay? But if you've got the same uh, product, right? If it says you were expecting 30 grams of aluminum and you got 25 grams of aluminum, you don't have to convert that to moles, okay? So that's what I was saying. So if you've got the same reactant or product that it gives you both the actual and the theoretical yield for, in grams or in mass, you can use that mass. But if it's like two different ones, right, then you can't use that. You're going to have to convert it to moles. Okay? So like in this equation here, you have to, the one that we did, uh, the big one on the board, you have to convert that to moles. Okay? It's best if you convert everything to moles, but I know on a test, you know, you're like going as fast as you can, you know, you're like trying to cut down as many steps as possible. So if it gives you like that, then don't convert, you know, because you want to cancel that step out. Okay? Okay, anyways, so going back to this, quantitative reaction, all products go to, or all reactions go to products. Non-quantitative reaction, some of the reactions are left over. Okay, so th what does that mean? Um, it's either that, you know, you didn't get, you know, full what you were expecting, like 67.8%. So it could be some of the reactions are left over, or uh, some of those reactions could have gone into side reactions, okay? So it would, can be qua non-quantitative either way. So if all your reactions get used up, right, but they went to side reactions, it's still non-quantitative. So the theoretical yield, again, is the maximum amount of product, and the actual yield is something that you perform in the laboratory, and I have to give you on a problem. So um, go over those extra extra ones on your own um, this weekend, and you can ask me about them when you come to the review session. So let's start uh, chapter six, states of matter. <coughs> Thank you. 
chapter 1. So again, we're going back to chapter 1, thinking about chapter 1. So this class is always, you know, going back and forth because you need to know that stuff from chapter 1. So let's do stuff now. But remember, in chapter 1, we just described changes in state. Remember, state is like phase, right? So you can change your state by going from a gas to a liquid or a liquid to a solid or a solid to a liquid or a solid to a gas or a gas to a solid, okay? So these changes in state, they're physical changes. Here we have pictures of a solid, gas, and liquid. So this is what we're going to be talking about is these states of matter and really talking about them. Kind of what we were talking about, like how we were talking about in the experiment from uh, a week ago with um, thinking about how molecules move, okay? So during a change of physical state, many other physical properties also may change. Density, shape, compressibility, and thermal expansion, okay? Um, of course, hopefully you know the density can change, right? We know these things. So you know that the density of water is less than the density of um, ice, right? Because ice floats on water, right? So you know that. Um, okay, so there's a difference in the physical properties among the states that you guys are already aware of, but we're going to um, beat it to death in a second. Okay? So remember, density is mass over volume. So if you can imagine the mass of these um, uh, things in the beakers, these particles in the beakers, so say this is just um, the same amount of particles going from a solid to a liquid to a gas. So if we uh, imagine that the mass of these three beakers or these three Erlenmeyer flasks is the same, right? The stuff that's in the, the flask is the same. We can see that the volume has expanded in all of them, right? So if we say that the mass of this is one, the mass of this is one, and the mass of this is one, right? The volume of this is very small, the volume of this is bigger, the volume of this is bigger, right? So if we take the same mass and divide it by increasingly bigger volumes, what we'll get is a less and less density, okay? So what we find here is that we've got very dense solids, okay? not as dense liquids, and very not dense um, gas, okay? Notice uh, in water, the solid and the liquid state are opposite in density, okay? So that's a weird one. Usually you'll have the solid being more dense than the liquid. With water, it's different. That's why, again, the water or the ice molecule or the ice particles float on top of the water molecule. Okay, so hopefully, looking at this, you can see the shape has also changed, right? Going from just kind of a, you know, a regular solid shape to a more disordered state in a liquid, kind of a free-flowing state, and then from that to the shape of the Erlenmeyer flask. So the shape is of the matter cake depends upon the physical state of that matter. The compressibility, this is the ability to squish squish it down, right, to compress it on top of itself. The change in volume of a sample that results from the change in pressure, the compressibility of a gas is much greater than that of a liquid, and then a solid is uh, very little able to be compressed because it's due to the space between the actual particles. With a gas, if we look, the space is very large between the different particles, right? So you can imagine being able to squish those things a liquid, you know, it's got a little bit of space that we can kind of squish it down, but not very much, honestly. And in a solid, they're all stuck together already, so you, it's almost impossible to compress a solid, right? especially relative to, you know, a liquid or a gas. And then thermal expansion, that's exactly what's happening here. As we increase the temperature or the average kinetic energy of these molecules, they go from this state to this state to this state. So that's the thermal, thermal meaning heat, right? Expansion meaning getting bigger, right? So these things thermally expand, right? Going from a solid to a liquid and then from a liquid to a gas. 
So here's uh, kind of a table that goes over all of that stuff that we just went over. So it kind of uh, puts it all right in front of you at once. And uh, here's another table uh, that talks about a couple of other things. Um, the particle motion. So the particle motion for a solid is that they vibrate around the fixed position. Uh, for a liquid, the atoms, remember, roll over or slide past each other. And particle motion in a gas, they don't even feel each other. Okay, they're essentially very far apart from each other. The intermolecular distance is very large. So they don't even feel any sort of attraction or repulsion from each other. For a liquid, the molecules are close together. And for a solid, of course, they're also close together. Very close. Um, and here you can see uh, the changes in state from a macromolecular point, like we've been looking at for the last few slides. So what we actually see uh, in an everyday experience. Okay. So you see the solid has the fixed shape, fixed volume. Liquid has a fixed volume, shape of the container. Gas, volume of the container, shape of the container. But we also can see it here on the molecular level where the solid is very structured and rigid. Okay, the liquid is less so structured, but the molecules are still very close together, in fact, touching each other. But then you see when it goes to a gas, the molecules are far apart from each other. They don't even interact with each other. So this is a different view, right? So this is what we see with our eyes, and this is what's actually happening on the molecular level. So why does this stuff happen? Well, there's this theory, of course, that's been, uh, you know, uh, worked on over the last couple centuries. Um, it's known as the kinetic molecular theory. And this describes, actually, what particles are doing in the various phases, OK? So um, the kinetic molecular theory of matter is a useful tool for explaining tool for explaining observed properties of matter. Um, so the first postulate is that matter, matter is made up of tiny particles called molecules. So hopefully by now you um, believe that. Um, particles are matter that are in constant motion and therefore kin possess kinetic energy. So anything that's in motion, anything that's in motion possesses this thing, this, this attribute or whatever called kinetic energy. Everything in motion. Yeah, everything in motion. Um, kinetic energy is just, again, it's a measure of, you can think of, relatively the temperature of these molecules, okay? Or the amount they're vibrating. Okay. Uh, postulate th three says that the particles possess potential energy as a result of repelling or attracting each other. So the potential energy is the e energy that these particles actually have stored within them. So if, I have, if I'm a negative particle, I have the potential to attract a positive particle. Okay, That's what potential energy means, is that you've got the potential to do this, even though you're not doing it at this point. Okay? Um, postulate four, the average particle speed increases as the temperature increases. <coughs> Remember, the temperature is, again, kind of a measure of the kinet average kinetic energy. And particles transfer energy to one another during collisions in which no net energy is gained or lost from the system. So they're like these pool balls that are colliding with each other but not losing any energy on collision. Okay, So they're like on a frictionless pool table hitting each other, and when they hit each other, they don't lose any energy either. So they just keep bouncing and bouncing and bouncing. That would be like if they were in a container. Okay, so let's talk more about kinetic energy. <coughs> um, again, kinetic energy is the energy of a particle has as a result of being in motion. It's usually abbreviated by this capital KE, and it's calculated using this equation here, KE 
equals the mass of the particle times its velocity squared divided by 2. What you need to know about um, kinetic energy or energy in general is that it's usually given in the units of joules. Okay? So you're going to have to do some unit conversions here. Um, notice one joule equals what we know as one, this cap capital J is joule. It's spelled like this.
That's something I know. Right? <laughs> I memor memorized it. Okay, notice that the units that you're getting here, right, if I multiply kilograms times meters squared, meters squared over seconds squared, that's going to give us kilograms meters squared. trying to get away from each other, okay, because you've raised their average kinetic energy. So if you recall, we've talked about different types of forces already. We're going to review that a little bit. We've talked about bond, bonds, right? So that would be like in the water molecule, you've got two bonds. So these are the forces responsible for the chemical properties of things, so the reactivity, because remember, when you react, you've got to break a bond and make a bond, okay, specifically a covalent bond. Okay, intermolecular forces, on the other hand, and we've talked about these before already, specifically hydrogen bonding, 
stop there for today.